Shalane Sean. Born in the small town of Brooks, Alberta, Shireen fell in love with fencing at a young age and has since gone on to become a four-time Olympian, with her best result being finishing fourth with her team in the 2004 Olympics, falling just short of a medal. Shireen is also a winner of the overall number one place in the FIE World Rankings and a two-time medalist at an individual world championships. Shireen's illustrious career has taken her all over the world, with the bulk of time spent training in countries like Canada, France, Germany, Hungary, and Italy. It's this chase for excellence that has allowed Shireen to earn a top 16 world ranking and maintain it for 15 years in a row. Now, Shireen resides in Italy, where she is a proud mother, mentor, and fencing coach. Don't worry, I say the same thing 50 times a day anyway. So you can <laughs> I know. Redo the oh, whole believe interview. me, yeah. And now okay, we're live. Now we're Except most of, the things I say are, most of the things I say are, kids, clean your room. I have to say that 50 times per day. So. Oh, oh, yeah. yeah. Or we put your pictures in the dishwasher. So today, we have, <laughs> in my opinion, drinking. a legendary fencer. I'm going to give you your roses today, Shireen, so don't blush too much. I think All you're right? only legendary <laughs> if you're dead. So just you can just say that I was slightly successful. That's fine. Uh, you know what? Let, let everybody else decide what slightly successful means. So a couple of things. I did some scavenging around the internet. So hopefully you don't get too scared. You know, internet is All a right. wild place. It is. But uh, so we have a first and foremost four-time Olympian. So let's get that nice and straight. Whoa. Now, that's not... as if that's not impressive enough, Shireen was from 1996 to 2011 in a top 16 world ranking. Bravo. Yeah, that's Missing not too bad. That was, that, I was kind of proud of that. And, and 2011 was just because I got pregnant. So that I was just going to say, that, uh, yeah. and because I, I heard uh, how little time you had to prepare for 2012. So that's the only reason that the 2012 you were not. Yeah, by choice, but still. By choice, yeah. of course. Yeah. You know? <laughs> now, to cap it off, we had a bronze medal at the individual world championships in 2005. Yeah. And we have, I'm sure a heartbreaking silver medal from 2009 world championships individuals. Wow. Yeah, it was heartbreaking. But the bronze medal was harder because I lost to Danuta Domowska from Poland. And I knew she was pairing cart and I just couldn't do anything about it. And I, I felt so incapacitated. She had an amazing day. She's a wonderful person. I'm very proud of her. But that was more frustrating than losing to, to Shutova in the, in the gold medal because the gold medal, it was so close. And we, and, but for the bronze medal, I was, I was destroyed in the bronze medal. Oh. She handily beat me. So, but you felt like it should have gone a little bit differently next time, right? <laughs> I, and, I, never, I don't think I will fence her again. Anyway. Yeah. And, and last the end, end is that, yeah. and again, we already mentioned that two weeks ago, is the, so far the all-time best result for Canada, the Olympic Games for fencing with the fourth place in the team event. Uh, that was I think brilliant. the whole country is uh, super proud of what yeah. you girls did that day. And we also, me and Yarek, we have discussed this on yeah. camera. We also hurt with you together for not quite making it through, but also very happy that, you know. We kind of went through this journey together with you guys. Yeah, that was incredible. You guys know what it's like to do. You guys did team, obviously, as well as individual. And I'd spent so many years, like all three of my, three of the four Olympics, I was just an individual at the Olympics and with no team. Yeah. And it was completely different. It was great. And I was preparing as much as I could, but there's something about knowing that when you look at your teammates, you're like, you guys have done all the same suffering that I have. You've done, had all the same, like, you know, exciting moments of, of competition. And it was, it was something completely different and way better than my individual results. Because oh, I remember... Sorry, sorry, can I, can I say a, that? Yeah, yeah, you're, sure. the you sure. you're the guest. You're the guest. No, I just remember the, um, when, I, when I won the overall World Cup, uh, it was um, at a competition in, in Vancouver, and I understood that there was no way that anybody could catch me for the rest of the year. And so I went away from that competition knowing, I think I won the, won the competition that day too, and I went away from the competition knowing, I, was, I remember being in the hotel room, like a university residence, and I just was overcome with like, exhaustion and like mental exhaustion and I just started crying I remember that moment where I was like oh and I felt all of a sudden really really lonely which is really strange and I so that was when you got the overall world ranking right that was in 2009 yeah, when some, 
when mathematically it was, it was yes, impossible yes, for yes. someone to test. Which I think actually is the, by far the most objective way of determining who's the best fencer in the world. It's not determined by sure. one competition, it's by all the World Cups combined for the listeners that don't know. Yes. However, well, people criteria. who do win on, on a day of the Olympics and stuff, they have a different sort of mental yeah. strength that I was never able to have. So I admire them for that also. But, um, but I remember that, that overwhelming, oh, I'm alone. This is so great. And I have nobody here with me. I'm alone. And of course, I had friends and I had you know, family and loved ones in my life. But it was not the same as even fourth place at the Olympics. We just looked at each other. We're like, wow, we went above and beyond what we thought was possible a year, a year, a year before. So that was much nicer to win by team, I have to say that. I'm sure. Uh, the, yeah. the amount of level that you could relate to each other to the suffering versus, yeah. yeah, I do know, I'm sure Yari could talk about that, how when you sit in the locker room, like those tears are bunching up. I'm, I'm, I can admit that. But sure, <laughs> and, yeah, sure. you know? Shereen, what, but Shereen, what helps you to stay on track when you were alone? Uh, a deep conviction that I thought I was going to, that I wasn't yet my best. And I thought, ah, if I really work hard, I think I can be even better than I was today. Even when I lost, I remember being so frustrated, being like, this one is stupid, I want to quit. Like that would run through my head, like I think it does everybody. And, uh, and then, but then I'm a irritatingly optimistic person where by the next morning, I'm like, all right, back at it. And I think the most important thing is just how you can stand up after those things, right? Even when you win, when you lose in an embarrassing way, or if you do something that's ridiculous, you know, I, that, that yeah. was for me. What about for you? I had the same situation. Like uh, I went to first my uh, national competition in the season and I lost out to make top 32 and I was crying in the locker yeah. room and in the hotel. And after that, my coach said like, listen, don't give up. You can do your own stuff. Like get back in the gym, try to train, show up, show them that you deserve to be in the team and do your best perform best and then I went to World Cup and I did the best result out of our team I got top eight in the World Cup and I got in the team this is the same year like a few months apart yeah and everything yeah, is have everything is possible just don't give up sure sure I know that's true and now on the other side on the flip side I was convinced that one day I would win the Olympics and now I'm sitting here 45 years old retired and obviously I'm never gonna win the Olympics. But I remember being convinced like, yep, yeah, that's what I, I know I'm gonna win the Olympics. I'm gonna win the world championships. I just feel that that's yeah. like what Shoot I for the stars, land am able the moon. to do. Yeah, that was, that was pretty much what it was, you know? And so I, I also can appreciate that, that sports taught me how to deal with massive, um, massive disappointment before the midlife crisis came. So in sports, your midlife crisis comes a lot earlier in the years. Like you might have it at 25 right. or 35 right. years old instead of at 55. Sure. So I felt it's like a, it was a nice thing to be able to force, force myself to deal with that. Shereen, it's 16 years. It's 16 years uh, in the top level of fencing. It's, it's four, four Olympic games. Uh, who you have to be, how you have to train to be at the same level for the, for the four generations. How do I have to do that? Yeah, what do you have to do to be this kind of person? How do you have to train? How do you have to prepare yourself for this kind of competition? It's a lot of competition during the, during the season, four years. This is like decade, four decades. It's a lot of time, but you have really to stay is. the same level all the time. Yes, you have to train consistently. I think that's the biggest thing. I think there's no way around that. And it doesn't matter if you have a great training session or the worst training session, you just have to get to training. And I remember being exhausted, having naps, like waking up 20 minutes before training, being like, oh, I'm so tired. But skipping training was just not in, in my realm of possibility. Like I never just said, oh, I'm just not going to go. Forget it. Because I knew that my coach was there. He was going to give me a lesson. I knew that I had a responsibility. I knew I would feel extra guilty if I didn't go. And I knew that I, when it came to the competition, I would feel, I don't really deserve to win. So I'm like, I just, I just go. Even if I have a crappy training, even if I'm tired, I'll just go, I'll show up, I'll do like the minimum that I can, and then I can leave. And I think that consistency, day in and day out, years after years after years, small consistency, and we're walking to training in flip-flops being like, oh, oh, I just give up, I can't do anything. And then just, but just showing up, putting on your fencing stuff, warming up, which warm up was always the worst for me, I hated it. Once I was warmed up, I was like, okay, the hard part of training is over. <laughs> 
So, so that was, I think that's the, I think that's the way you have to train. It's just small consistency every day. Consistency. That's it. Right. Yeah. So yeah. I would also argue a little bit more. So consistency. Yes, for sure. You got that. Mm -hmm. But I, because I did some research and I yeah. know that you have, of course, started fencing in Canada, then fencing has taken you all the way to France, then to Hungary, now all the way in Italy. Um, throughout what parts, like, so were you, where were you training predominantly while you were trying to make Olympic game runs? Uh, the first time I even considered going to the Olympics, like, oh, this is a possibility for me was when I was at university and like my first fencing coach, Alan Nelson in, in Alberta, he was, That's right. we're, we still talk to each other every, every couple of weeks. We send messages. We're like super close still. He's like my brother. And he was the one who's always telling me, you could do great things. You could go to the Olympics. And I was like, whatever, you don't know anything. How can you, this is ridiculous. And, but I was like, okay, sure. And it I was just the kept inception. And then, yeah, but I never really believed it. And then when I went to Ottawa and trained with a French coach who was living in Canada, Manuel Guité, he said, he gave me enough technique mm -hmm. that I ended up winning a World Cup while training with him. And I was like, oh, this is possible. This isn't a real possibility. Yeah. And then so from there, I decided that uh, he was the one that told me. I've always had brilliant coaches who have said, if I can't give you what you, what you need at this moment, go somewhere else which doesn't happen very often. I don't think in the fencing world, I think especially coaches now, really... I feel yeah, like maybe when now. you were coming up, uh, maybe there was still an understanding of a greater community, maybe understanding that the resources are scarce in particular yeah. in this region, whereas yeah. now it's becoming more so pulling the blanket towards you, you know? Yes. And, and people feel like a deep personal connection, which is great, but they feel that they are the only ones that can teach like I alone can fix you. And I'm like, mm -hmm. that's ridiculous because even as a parent, you know that you don't parent your child the same when they're two as when they're 15, right? That's right. So yeah, you know yeah. that and at a certain point, you have, to, you have to push them to like, they have to hang out with their friends and they have to have, you know, other coaches have an influence on their life. So, so there has to be a way of sharing, a, a, you know, raising so knowledge. I'm beginning to understand right? that you did have multiple coaches, right? It's not sure. like, so what were some of the things that you have gained from each uh, new coaching situation. And what were some of the reasons or like, what were you searching out? So essentially, why were you looking for different situations? That's great questions. Wow. Well, I love fancy. It was preparing. <laughs> yeah. No, that's a really good question because that's something that I, that I, I think about often, you know? Um, so my first coach gave me the love of the sport and deep, friendship and deep respect. He respected me as a person, an athlete, everything. Mm -hmm. My second coach gave me an excellent technique. He and that was, was the- Manuel Vite, the mm -hmm. French guy in Canada, in Ottawa. Yeah, That's right. He could give double-handed lessons. He was like a technical genius. I've never seen a better technician. And then I moved to, um, to train in Paris with Leva Vasseur, Daniel Leva Vasseur. Right. And he gave me massive understanding of the game, how the game is played tactics so he was the first three minutes you do this second three minutes you do this third three minutes you do this here you push in this two meters like we trained so much tactical positioning on the piece mm -hmm. um, when to do what timing like it was it was so professional the way that he trained us and then after that uh, it was but it was also a bit much I felt a lot of pressure there and financial pressure also because living in Paris on a pathetic I mean, salary I could imagine fun. yeah, yeah. Expensive. And so I had to find somewhere like he coached basically for free. So that was great. I, not like he was demanding any money, but just the cost of life there. And so I said, I have to go somewhere where I can just be a bit more independent and be um, and survive financially. So I decided to, I asked if I could move to Hungary. I found one of the coaches there that I had seen not dictate so much to his coat, to his students, but just let them do their thing. And that, so, and that must have been a first time in quite a few years that now you're entering into a completely different style of fencing, essentially, right? So sure. you had two yeah. French coaches in a row. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the French style, as you know, is like lots of movement. We're just going to go super, super it's hard. More physical. Push you right? until, until you're not physical in the strong way. Maybe it is now. I think it is now. But it's, it's uh, more, more jumpy and less, 
less smooth than other like like Russians and, and Ukrainian. You guys are all about like the flow and sucking people in, and, and, right? <laughs> and the French are like, well, that's and the French are like, person to talk to, very nice, yes. <laughs> And the French are like, I'm going to just confuse you so much with all this movement. And then, oh, I hit you because I'm fast and I'm super well trained. So it was really good to develop my, my physical training. Mm -hmm. um, and then in Hungary, it's somewhere in between both. You know, Hungarians have this like, they have a real capacity to go from smooth to like destroying, to just Is being that, like direct. Arm they don't need, up. yeah, they don't need like a counter action all the time. They can just but they can also be really smooth and really technical around the, around the hand. Mm -hmm. So I think they have a quite a complete game. And I really like the coach there. He was, I saw him giving lessons and laughing with the student. His student would screw up and he'd be like, oh, you're terrible. Oh. And the coach, <laughs> the student was like, ah. Yeah. And I thought, that's the one I want to be coached by. So I asked him, will you coach me? And he was like, mm, come for one month. We'll see. If it works out, it works out. If it doesn't, it doesn't. And we had a super, super good fencing coaching student relationship. I really enjoyed him. He said, I don't want to know anything about your personal life. I don't want to like, like do the stopwatch. If you're yeah. out of shape, I'll tell you to get in shape. I just want to give you lessons and give you what I know. And I was like, okay. And it was really, really good. So I, I and that's where I feel that I dominated my, that was at, I was at the best when I was with peak. him because I had accumulation of all the coaches from behind me who had given me different parts of the game. And then with him, I was like, I was free to do my own thing and independent with a massive amount of training behind me. Then after I stopped being coached by him because he had to coach the national team. Then I had Gabor Shalaman, who was uh, Hungarian based, but German trained, like he trained a lot in Germany. So he had a mm -hmm. bit more German style, which was a bit more a like, bit more. Uh, duck, 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 exactly. duck. <laughs> but it was fine. The distance was a bit closer, but it was, it was also really explosive. In one, in one fast time. And I have never been in such good shape as I was with him. And I love him dearly. We had a super good coach-student relationship where we would just make each other laugh like crazy. And also, he was the one guy who said, on an Olympic year, a, a true Olympian even trains on Christmas Day. So we had like training on Christmas morning. And then I went to his house with his family. Of for course, Christmas. of course. So it was you all made a day out of it. <laughs> Yes, exactly. But he was the one that was like, especially like consistency, consistency, consistency. So mm -hmm. I also appreciate it. And then after that, I had Kovac. I don't know if you know Ivan Kovac. Yeah, oh, which, yes, of course we know him, yes. And I had not so many, um, not so many options left, especially because I was like, I wanted to still live in, in Europe. And I didn't want to change schools and get coached by an Italian because it's too different. It's close. The distance is close. The hand is really it, curvy and i was yeah, using a all that Perry and four. Like, we are not we're, there's no way i can have enough time to become great under the italian system so i asked ivan if he would coach me and just as a word of of uh, advice to you guys of course coaches, all ears he, he said the best thing that i've ever heard was i'd always asked my my coaches will you please coach me can you can you please give me a lesson can i you know so i was always the initiator mm -hmm. and i went to and they were always like okay that would be fine you yeah, know yeah. they were always very pleasant about it and very willing of course but i never felt like they felt that it was an honor to work with me and the first time in my whole life i said ivan would you consider giving me lessons and he looked at me and he goes shari that was my hungarian name he goes shari it would be an honor and i was oh. like oh my god and three months after that, just the, just the mental little thing, three months after that, I had second at the world championships because I was so well trained with Gabor. Gabor was beside me on the piece, giving me technical information, mm -hmm. Gabor Shalomon. And then I had Ivan behind me saying, like in my head saying, it's an honor for me to train you. And I thought, oh, I can do anything. And so I felt super good. So that was... That was probably the, you know. So Ivan, he was inspired you, right? A little yeah, bit. Yeah, he's very and good. And Gabor gave you a lot of knowledge about fancy technical, yeah. physical parts, and right? Physical. I was and, in killer shape. Oh my God. But you agree if like uh, coaches and, and students supposed to have a relationship, without the relationship, we can build a, a good a good strategy for the ballot for the, for the whole season, let's say, right? Sure. So yeah. relationship at the first place. Right. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Definitely. And it doesn't always have to be super personal relationship. Like with Kulchar, I don't, I, I, you know, didn't know anything about him, but it was enough that we had a mutual respect for each other. He saw I was working hard. I saw he was giving me everything technically in terms professional, of professional, right? It was, it was super professional. Yeah.
Very so nice. now, yeah. uh, again, the little birdie has showed that you are now a coach yourself and you have yes. a club in Italy, which by the way, congratulations. I'm sure it's a tough struggle at the moment, but you know, we yeah, all aspire to be it's there too. It's a project. <laughs> it's a project. Um, so it, see, I'm leading kind of all together trying to make a full circle here. Yeah. So you went through all these different types of schools. You received different parts from different knowledges. Now it's time for you to put it together as a coach. What is your view? Like what, what are you going to try to actually translate? Uh, like what was the filter? What has left from that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, my primary concern is the person as a whole. That's always my primary concern. That's why I'm happy to work with experienced fencers. I, when I was coaching in Treviso, it's where I first started coaching. Mm -hmm. I had, as I was contributing, I was not their primary coach, obviously, because my lessons are nowhere near as professional as they could be for me to coach somebody at the highest level. No chance right now, just because I haven't had enough experience. And, um, and, but in terms of how I approach them is a person as a whole. Like I need to know that I need them to understand that just winning and fencing is not enough. And mm -hmm. that's not the only thing. It's a super important thing, but the process of trying to win is what's going to develop them into people that's that right. will contribute to the world at large after they retire. So I feel like so many people need to concern. hear this. Uh, mm. To win is just like a destination. We talked about this before. So there is a like, kind of journey to get to this destination. You have to understand sure. that you have to train to get back in shape and so on. There's a lot of stuff what you have to train on to get to this destination. And a lot of people just think, oh, what will be if I win? Or how people look will be looking at me if I win or how the parents will be thinking about me if I win. But it's not about winning. It's about getting to the destination, going through this journey. For sure, for sure. And you can even see that the, the most important thing about that is when you train little tiny kids, right? Like I have mass, like very first kids who pick up their sword and we have little plastic swords. And I can see that there's a way to teach them tactics without being too, uh, too specific about it, where you just mm -hmm. say, okay, now you're just going to move. When you feel like it, you see. When, when is a good time to hit the other person? And instinctively, they just feel like they can go forward. And then the other person is like, oh, and I'm like, listen, that's the game. And so hopefully this will teach them that like someone getting a point on them in, a, in that way is not like, oh, and then they're not afraid to take a risk. They're like, okay, problem solve, problem solve, which I think yeah. is, really, is really helpful for like, that's right, because there's sure. a coach, you could teach it in an authoritarian manner. It's like, you must do a certain way, and then you could, lock, you could by accident, that would lock a student in a very tiny box, right? It would be yes. very tough to get out. Mm. Well, I you having to see here, that. I feel in Italy, there's something about the general culture mm -hmm. where it's pretty demanding. Like, I don't know if you've ever seen Italian kids sit at supper with their parents out for lunch or something. They're super well-behaved. Um, they'll like the best. eat the pasta. They'll like eat pasta with clams, and they'll like sit there because they're super well behaved. They're like not the like ladder. Canadian kids that want like what they want. Yeah. So there's a lot of, but there's also a lot of um, restriction here where they're almost afraid to make a mistake for some things. There's a low risk taking when it comes to uh, when it comes to sports or even school. You know, mm -hmm. they would prefer to to have a perfect mark than to take a risk and do a project that's really hard and maybe get less of a mark, but like make a big impression, right? Mm -hmm. Not see, all the athletes, because there's some, you know, crazy people that are, that are amazing. Of course, like of Montana course. Or people like that, that have like this big risk taking. All of the great champions have risk taking, but there's like we this know base that. level here. Yeah. There's a base level here where I found when I was giving a lesson, they would, um, it's a lot of, I do this and you do that. It's not, it's not problem solving that you give to the student. Whereas I, I learned that in Hungary was, was uh, I would do something and my coach would screw it up. And instead of him telling me what to do, I would just be like, oh, what if I do this? What if I do that? What if I do a duck, you know? And he would say, yeah, there's a million choices, pick one, you know? Whereas I have sometimes the students are like, oh, and they'll freeze. Not my little kids, but the, the higher level students that I was coaching. Of course, of course. And I'm like, just solve the problem. I said, give me, what would you do? You know, and they're like, um, and they want the perfect answer and I'm like, there's better answers and there's worse answers, but there's no perfect answer. I'm like, just pick an option and then do it, you know? So would you tell us, would you tell us what the uh, Italian fencing based on, like what, how the lesson goes in, in, in Italy? 
the lesson is based super lot on technique. They have a killer technique here. Mm -hmm. Whatever they do, they're going to do it perfectly. They're going to do the parry at exactly the right time. Like here they do some footwork that is so amazing where they will coordinate with the back foot and the right foot right. and which goes first. I've so seen with Tony explain fresh... that back foot has to move a lot of times first and all of that. Yes, yes. And I don't know if that crossed my mind so much. Of course, I had some coaches who taught me that. Gabor taught me that part of the time. He'd be like, connect the back foot and then you can get a better lunch. And for, for if you want like a massive fast lunch, right? Mm -hmm. And I was like, that seems counterintuitive. Counter but here they, they work a lot on that and they do it in the lesson. They have really quiet, um, quiet lessons that aren't like choo, 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 big showy or anything, mm -hmm. but they're really focused on doing the technique perfectly. Right. So I think they have, and they start at a really young age here. But they for start instance, at like six, seven years old. But for instance, if uh, the coach already built up technique with the yes. student, he's like yes. grown up man, like 20 yep. years old, right? He already accomplished his goals, juniors goals, for instance, what goes next whenever he already technically good? What do you mean? In what way? Like, Sorry. What what goes next? Like what what they gonna build next? Like they do some part of the strategy stuff or whatever. I don't know. Like if he already grown up kid and his technique is really nice because you you telling us like in in Italy they like building up the technique very clean nicely. But if yeah. the, he already already like good everywhere with the peers with the launches with the flashes with everything what goes next after it how they combine this kind of skills i think later then they start learning the tactics of when to do that perfect technique on the piece mm -hmm. i don't think they start tactics early enough here but yeah. they start the, I, th i think they start the technique beautifully and i think um that's why some kids are super strong when they're 20 here and then psh, you don't see them after that because they, they lose optimism when they start seeing that their usual stuff doesn't work. And it's like, yeah, it will work. Just give it a year, That's right. do it That's in right. training and do it in, in impossible situations. And you'll start to learn the possible situations in, in, in training, right? In non-threatening situations. And I don't think that they give themselves enough time to make mistakes. A lot of these brilliant young athletes. You know, so then, then they would work on that. The people who have enough time and develop slowly enough, um, then they start working on the tactics a little bit later, right? Yeah. But they're not, they're not so focused on tactics because they have such a good school of, of fencing. Like they can parry, they can attack, they can do counter time, they can do pretty yeah, much yeah. anything. And, yeah. you know, a lot of countries, uh, as long as you believe to uh, philosophy, essentially, and that's what it is, that's what we do, essentially, it is a philosophy, as long yeah. as you believe uh, philosophy from a certain, uh, how would I say it, from a certain part of the world that has established its history in the results, mm -hmm. let's say, it will work. It's just as long yes. as there is yeah. a buy-in with it. And they have like massive, that's what the thing is, the buy-in is also the whole system they have behind them. They believe the coaches that are taking them everywhere. They always have a coach with them. I don't know if I've ever seen really very many Italians doing a competition alone. No, Whereas no, like the Estonians, even for I veterans, think I saw their national coach once. A physiotherapist and a coach. Yeah, <laughs> I've yeah, seen yeah. That. and they have they no. have like a, a technician to fix their FAs. And I'm like, <laughs> like I, I I tried to give a little lesson to my students. I'm like, okay, so you just have to take the, like when their their FAs wouldn't work. They're like, what do I do? And I'm like, do you have a screwdriver? And they're like, no. I'm like, well, you're lucky I have one in my purse. <laughs> oh wow so, so there's um they rely on the system and they have a great system so I, I don't think that if you're not if you're not required to be independent why would you force yourself to be independent that's the thing i'm like they don't have to make their own hotel reservations like we did or sleep in a gymnasium or do all that's these right, like, that's right sleep in a youth hostel because <laughs> they just don't they have, have a systematic so approach they? it's yeah, yeah. it's I like really a part of the, the school it's like a subject up. sure yeah yeah does this an, uh, an athlete supposed to concentrate at his own competition only and that's yes. it this stuff yeah. what he has to do how to prepare just mentally physically and that's it yeah no yeah. destruction at all yeah and the the one thing that i would uh, if i was italian that i would definitely prefer to be a bit more independent i don't know if i was italian as a youngster if i would have fit into the system here i, I developed too late i was a really late bloomer that's right and i was way too independent like if a coach tells me i remember once i won a world cup when gabor shalawan told me mm -hmm. I, I was fencing against branza anna branza and i said 
I think I can take her. I think I can parry six. And he looked at me. Like, she has a great attack. You and he looked at me nice. and he goes, yeah. he goes in, a, in a dream world, he said. And I was like, <laughs> you don't think I can parry six? And it's true. I was, a te I was terrible at parrying six. But I thought, I can fake parrying six. So I was like pretending like I was going to parry six. And that stopped her enough so that I could hit her. And yeah, I was like, yeah. So you see, and he's like, you didn't really hurt six. So uh, I had this sort of like rebellious um, winner's all attitude. Yeah, maybe like a sort of like yeah. rebel attitude. Yeah. And I don't know if I would have fit into the system here so well because it's perfectly functioning for a specific type of athletes. I think. Yeah. Perfect. So there's something that I really want to kind of also touch on uh, because it's pretty rare that somebody has your journey. This was the theme there throughout the podcast. And you also mentioned something about students, if they don't succeed essentially with this technique, they may lose that positivity or desire. Yeah. Well, it's easy to sit here and talk how, oh, look at your journey, right? But the reality of things that none of those qualifications for those Olympic games were guaranteed. After the one that has completed, you have another three year period and then a fourth year to essentially qualify. Um, how was like mentally, like essentially was it for you? So after each games, I'm sure there is like everybody, there is pressures by the parents, you know, there's uh, this familial pressures, professional work pressures, and you're talking about sports. And this is maybe for you, it's on a higher level, but we have kids that are dealing nowadays, you know, they have, besides the high level private schooling, we have violin, we have tutoring in French, and we have fencing where we have to do high results to go to Harvard, for example, right? So, I mean, there's some uh, related uh, aspects for these kids. So how are you dealing essentially with this unknown of what's going to happen next? What were your desires, essentially, and what could help the upcoming generation? Well, I think that obviously every person functions differently. And so what worked for me might not work for someone else. And I don't of think course. it necessarily worked for me because the approach that I had now, if I look back, I think I would have tried a different approach. Because my, my idea was you always have another one. Because I really like to, I like the idea of playing. And mm -hmm. I felt free when I knew it matters, but it doesn't matter that much, mm -hmm. you know? Sort of like going on a date with a guy that you kind of like, but you're not super into. So you're at your best self and you end up like making him fall in love with you because you're like amazing. That's but right. if you really liked him, you'd be like, mm -hmm. right? So <laughs> it's that kind amazing. of thing. I love that. And so I was always like, I was always thinking, oh, there'll just be another Olympics. There'll just be another world championships. There'll just be another Pan American games, whatever. And that, I, I tried to use that to calm me down. Looking it's kind of it, routine for you, right? Right. Okay. But I'm not sure that that was the best approach. I think, mm -hmm. because my friend Adam Vancouverton, who's a paddle kayak, mm -hmm. um, uh, Olympic champion paddler, he said his approach was, it's my last one. Every, every, every event he imagined, this is the last competition I'm ever going to do. Mm -hmm. So that he would give it all and just be like, may as well enjoy it. And in the last, let's say in the last three, four years of my fencing, I started doing yoga and meditating a lot more. And nowadays, I think like, maybe every day is my last day. Not in a way that's like, oh, I'm going to die today. But I have that approach where when I'm going for a run, I have this little app on my phone. It's called We Croak. And mm -hmm. it, five times a day, it sends you a little, a little message that says, remember, you're going to die. And so you look at <laughs> it and you're like, oh, yeah. And then you just look around and you're like, okay, well, if today is my last day, you still have to get stuff done, right? It's not like you're just going to sit there yeah. and like, you yeah. know, do, do your dreams. So it, when I'm on a run and that app pops up, I think, if I'm suffering, I'm like, why am I suffering? I'm suffering, but I'm gonna enjoy this suffering. And I'm like, whew, sunny day, wow, okay. And so it just shifts them, it, it reframes everything into making it manageable and enjoyable. Because I think if you're gonna suffer in terms of like making yourself suffer like uh, physically, or you're gonna be exhausted mentally, you should at least find some joy in it, right? Or if I'm helping my kids with their homework and that app pops up, like, oh, you remember, you're going to die. And I'm like, well, thank God, because I can't do any more grade three math. <laughs> but I think I get a chance to sit here with my children and, and I'm the one helping them. And that's beautiful. And so it's, it really reframes everything. And I think looking back on my, on my experience, had I had that approach, at least tried that approach a bit more, I think mm -hmm. I might have had a more, uh, just a happier journey along the way. Mm -hmm. It would have been less stressful, I believe, you know, so that's what I would have done differently. So that's what I would recommend to your, to your students is to try different ways. Some people love like, 
I have another one. And they really function well like that. But yeah. other people, I, and I think you need to try both. I think you need to try a, a bunch of different ways until you find what works for you at that moment. Like 1414, every, yeah. every training bout I had for the last, I think, eight years, as soon as I'd finished the match, I would say uh, revenge with one hit That's to whoever cool. I was mm -hmm. fencing with. So if I won, I would be like, do you want one, hit, one more hit? And if they won, I'd be like, come on, one more hit. But just yeah, one yeah. hit. And in my head, I would say 1414. And then I would, but I wouldn't think 1414. I would think zero, zero. Okay, just try to get the first hit. And it would super relax me. So even though, and then when it was 1414, I'd be like so relaxed. And I won like a massive amount of matches in, in like the last hit, except the world championship. <laughs> We're not talking about that. <laughs> Nobody saw that, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I had, I had this like super enjoyable feeling and at 1414 where I was not like stressed out. I was like, I see the hit, it's zero, zero. I'm just going to get the first hit. And whatever I did, of course, it's painful to lose. But even if I did lose in that manner, I lost in a way that was like, ah, damn it. It wasn't like, damn it. You tried have, to take control I, of your faith. Yes. I have uh, another story about 1414. Uh, once uh, I was fencing uh, at the national competition. And there was uh, maybe, you know, Dima Chumak and uh, Mali. Uh, they, okay. they were in the Olympic team both. So they were fencing. And there was a 14 14 game. And Mali yeah. scores point. He was screaming. Dima came over and he said, like, Mali, listen, this is, wasn't a cool touch. Let's redo it. Listen, come on, listen. Let's do it again. Let's do it over. He said, let's redo it. He said, come on, Dima, are you kidding me? Listen, <laughs> I scored the point. <laughs> Let's shake hands and go, go over it. <laughs> Yeah, that He's was like, funny. Don't you want to be even? Yeah, come on. This? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Listen, that was a cool touch. <laughs> so speaking of touches, uh, yeah. maybe uh, you care to share with us a little bit uh, for now with your wisdom, of course. Uh, what was like some of the things? So let's say you're coming up uh, at this World Cup. You have a fencer you've never fenced before. You never really scouted them for whatever reason. Maybe it's yeah. like top 64, top 128. But you still get solid opponents regardless, right? Sure. Yeah, what yeah, was your approach? Usually. How are you starting the bout? What are your things that you're trying to accomplish maybe early on so you could secure the win? Sure. Well, first thing I would do is because I never had to fence the first day except the last year or whatever. So That's I would know who I was having. And in the last couple of years, now it's all online, but in the last right. couple of years, even there was a list of who beat, uh, who beat who and how, how many times they met, they beat each mm -hmm. other, you know, That's right. the record of the match up record. Yes. But before that, even I had an address book and I had everybody's name in it. Um, nice. And so I could look up, I had written in that address book, uh, their best action. Um, what beats them, what I've seen them lose on, who beats them, what hand they were, and, uh, and something else. And this is something that was anyway, ongoing and, and what your I, career, And right? what I would do next time, what I would do mm -hmm. next time. So, and then I would be like, okay, who do I have to fence? Uh, so-and-so from uh, Kim from Korea. I'd look it up, I'd be like, okay, Kim from Korea. Okay, da, 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 da. And so I would have an idea. So mm -hmm. I knew that who beat her, and I knew if someone beats her who is really jumpy, that's then right. I'm like, well, You're... I can just fake being jumpy that's and they'll right. get freaked right. out and then I can do my own game after that, right? Mm -hmm. It's just putting them enough off balance that they can, that, that they don't know, that they're not comfortable mm -hmm. and then you're able to do what you want to do, right? And if I couldn't, then, then I would look at their feet because people with really big feet usually have, <laughs> have trouble um, changing distances, changing directions Absolutely, quickly. Yeah. And, uh, and I would just think, I would look at them physically and I'd be like, what would make you uncomfortable? are you more comfortable attacking me or are you more comfortable being defensive? And then I would do whatever would make them the most uncomfortable. So if they were comfortable attacking, I would apply lots of pressure. Okay. Even though I, I probably That's wasn't right. going to hit them with that, right? So just so that they were like, oh, this is not a nice match. And then I would have time to make a strategy. So that would be my first couple, my first two or three minutes. And we had good advice. Uh, Danielle taught us this was um, never be down by more than two points in the first three minutes. First if you're down 2-0, okay. you stop. You like, now it's changed because there's a, there's a passivity and stuff, yeah, but yeah. You, just, you just shut down. And you yeah, don't, you don't risk out, going break, down more than three or four. Advice. Yeah, because otherwise it gets much harder to, to recuperate after that. And so yeah, my matches with him were really like, uh, I remember we learned to be very, very um, chilled out and not like, not get angry. Um, I just read Muhammad Ali's uh, an autobiography on Muhammad Ooh. Ali. And they said one of his biggest strengths was that even when he was down, 
he wouldn't compound his errors with anger and frustration. He would just uh, like very coldly try to solve the problem instead of being like, I'm going to be the greatest. You know, he had a lot of that, like, I'm going to be the greatest. But when he was in danger, he was like, oh, how to solve this, how to solve this. So, and I thought that was pretty good advice for fencers was not to compound it with anger, which is really hard to do. That's why I recommend meditation for all fencers around the world. <laughs> it doesn't have to be like spiritual. It just has to be something of like mindfulness, like knowing where your mind is, you know, and being present where, where you are at your where best. You are, yeah. Uh, what do you think, Shireen? How many times do you have to change your strategy during the bout? It depends on the intelligence of your opponent. Oh, if you, we're talking Doesn't about it? your level. Yeah, it is. It is. But we're talking uh, like about if I can level. do the same thing and beat somebody on the, with the same thing, then I yeah. just keep doing that. You keep doing I, it. I, I, I really do. I might change one thing so that they think I'm not going to do that, but then I go right back to what I was doing before. Because why would I like run myself ragged? And I realized that in my older age, when I didn't have all the energy in the world, I, I just did a competition a couple of years ago and mm -hmm. just to help up my fencing club, the, the fencing club in Treviso. And I was fencing against these girls who were super in shape. They were not like the best level in the world, but they were good Italians, right? The, like medium level Italian fencers. And I was like, what is going to beat you? And I would find out that one thing and I'm like, all right, that's what I'm going to do. Because I'm like, I do not have the energy to run around after you like a chicken with my head cut off. <laughs> I, so, had a, I had a coach once. It was once actually that, easier. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry to interrupt. No, uh, please. Uh, I had a coach once, uh, kind of what you just said, tell me this kind of metaphor about he's like, once you figure out a hole in your opponent, you essentially want to keep serving him potatoes. This is Ukraine. Potatoes are a yeah. big metaphor, right? You want to keep serving him potatoes. The only thing is, you want to first give them fried potato, baked potato, boiled potato. But regardless, it just dressed up differently. But in the end, that hole, you're going to exploit the same way, which is right. something that has stuck with me forever. That's a very good analogy, actually. <laughs> it really is because you're disguising it, but it's yes. essentially the same thing. Exactly, yeah, nice. exactly, you know. Yeah, yeah. That's okay. great. And one thing that I remember Ivan gave me this excellent uh, uh, strategic advice that might be good for your fencers once. Um, is he was saying, if you, if something happens to you in the bout, it's like being in a river. And I think this is like a, a, a sort of a Buddhist mentality philosophy mm -hmm. um, is if you're in a river and the water's passing you by, you don't have to grab at everything in the river because then you're just going to drown at a certain point. You can just let things pass by. So if someone's doing something on the, in the match and it's just noise, you just let it pass by. You don't have to react to everything, whether it's like trash talk or like intimidation or a coach screaming. He's like, you can just let that pass by. And he's like, you do not have to grab at everything in the river. And I'm like, that was also a really nice image that stuck with me. Uh, it's the same with the fakes. No need to react on all fakes. Just pass yeah. it by. Just break the distance look, and start it over. It's the yeah. same thing. That's true. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. You're absolutely right. Yeah. And there's also a little bit of this... Um, ego battle going on too is that sometimes let's say you have an opponent that's doing lots of feints and you're gonna on purpose ignore one or two or three but that's really like you're taking a quiet gamble essentially right you're just establishing that belief into your opponent oh my god he has no reaction or she has no reaction so hopefully you're gonna get that advantage there too yeah yeah for sure but that also comes with a little bit of no confidence. Be have been there and lost, and now know how to win again. Kind yep. of deal. And enough pattern recognition to know. Okay, I know that pattern. I know that pattern. I'm not going to fall for it. Right. Yeah. Uh, if you're going to go sharing in the past, what was your toughest bout in your fencing career? Mm -hmm. Like my toughest opponent. Yeah, toughest bout opponent, whatever. Well, I had a couple of opponents that I don't know if I ever beat. Uh, Mara Navaria, this Italian fencer. Yeah. And she, why? And why you couldn't beat them? Uh, because I just didn't, I never trained, I, mm -hmm. I, I never trained enough just <laughs> direct attacks. Mm -hmm. I did so much manipulating off the mistakes of my opponents and they never gave a chance to have a mistake. Like she would just and I was like, holy shit. I was like, ah, this is like, what can I do against this? And so eventually at one point I just said, I have to start fencing like her because what if, what, what would she do against herself? So I was like, Arr! and then I got a bunch of points in a row and I was like, oh, well, that was a good lesson. And then I also, <laughs> I fenced every day 
with Emma Shea Sass. Oh, Sass. oh she is crazy. Yeah. I think she beat me for like three years straight. Oh, that's not the Hungarian connection you got, right? Every day. Every day she would beat me. We were in the same club. We had the same coach. And I would do everything I could to beat her. And she, she had this like iron fist and she was just, <laughs> she could just see my blade. Anyway, would so you feel- those were my hardest opponents for sure. And they were <laughs> like lovely people and they never gave me an inch. They were never, they never it. like let me win out of sympathy. They were just like, I'm going to beat you. Thank you, lovely Matt. And I'm like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. hey, best friends forever yeah, that way, forever. you know. But on the strip, you have no friends, right? It's, it's yeah, your opponent. Yeah, sure, sure, but sure. Uh, if you'd be talking about SAS, right, would you, uh, didn't you find the tool just to just trigger, like to push her or find the touch and just to base the strategy on this touch and something like that? Stronger and just as brave as I was. So she and was above your level a little bit. She was above don't think my so? level. Okay. For sure. I think that if I had... I think I, in a competition at a World Cup once, I think I lost her 15-14. That's the closest I ever got to her. And I was like, oh my God, I'm going to beat her. Oh my God, I'm going to beat her. And then I lost. And she was just like that same like big smile. And I was like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> that was nice, Bao. Thank you. So I, because I, because That's I, the worst, I, I agree. <laughs> because I never, lost, I never lost consistently to very many people. It was, if, I, if, if they were very hard for me, it would be like one and one and one and one. But she was just like so, she was everything... She was the opposite fencer to me and, and faster and stronger. And I just couldn't keep up, you know? But and, there's and also a lot to be said that she had the scouting report on you all and out as well, right? So I'm, in a sense, you guys trained together, right? So you yeah, both knew each side. Yeah, she didn't do much different in training than she did in, in competition. She mm-hmm. was just like a, a machine against me. <laughs> I, 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 have no, I don't know. Now, now I can say I would try to fence like her. Maybe I would take like a pistol grip and I would yeah. try to just out sass sass. But I don't know if I could do it. But it would be worth a try because everything I'd done up to then had been losing. So. Oh, yeah. And yeah, of course, when you're tough. younger, There's your some people that you just have to say. Yeah, I was good, but I was not the best the world has ever seen by any chance. And she's just better than me what can i say you know i tried i literally tried so many things it's not like i was like giving up every day i was like today's the day i'm like i lose today wasn't the day (laughs) that's that's the reason we have sometimes we have to accept there's the people who's better better than us and that's what i'm trying to tell my kids that's my students that's uh, even that you win the competition it's not the end there is someone is better than you you have to reach that level and then another and another level and then whenever you say listen coach i beat everyone there is no one around the world so i can beat so what should i do next now you it's time to fence me my friend (laughs) you know that's every time happens like that (laughs) yeah but i think the important thing is also that um that you're just always trying to find a way that's that's the important thing is that i never because i remember there was a couple of fencers that i remember when i would fence with them in world cups we would get to a certain level and then I would just see them crack and they'd be like, and they just sort of give up. Mm-hmm. And it was such an, it was such an unpleasant feeling to win that way. And because I knew how frustrated they were and I kind of felt bad for them. And then I was like, Oh, that's a terrible place to be. And so I know with her, I never just gave up because I'm like, I'm not going to be that person. I am trying everything I can and nothing I did work. So I think that's a little bit of a lesson in itself. That's like, Try, try again. And if it doesn't work, well, some things just don't work in life. You know, that's, that's a reality. <laughs> but the mentality should remain because I'm sure we could sure. all recall at least, at least one, and I'm sure you could all recall multiple situations where you've maybe seen someone you've been a part of where you pulled off, pulled off an impossible win where it statistically sure. looked like you're down. But just yeah. because of that will, not necessarily the skill, but the will behind it is what overcame. Yeah, yeah, the skill, yeah, yeah, of course. Sure. Absolutely. So, yeah. uh, Sharon, I want to go back a little bit to Olympic sure. Games because it's uh, it's for me it's kind of uh, emotionally st- stress, you know. Like, oh, we want to live all, vicariously through. Yeah. You. Now, yeah, let me put like it flat some, out. <laughs> yeah, some some juicy about it. So, uh, the first of all, like you had like. Uh, you accomplished like some medals in the world championships, right? Mm-hmm. But uh, you didn't get the chance to get a medal from the Olympic Games. But what is the reason between the world championship and Olympic Games? What do you feel at the Olympic Games and uh, world championship? What do you feel inside? World championships, they were, first of all, 
a lot more world championships. So just sheer statistics should say that I would at least have a better chance at the Olympic, at the world championships in the Olympics. Okay. So besides that, let's just, that's the and math. That gave yeah, that's some peace of mind. That's a math. That's fine. Yeah. But besides that, I'll admit that there was definitely a mental, a different mental approach. The world championships, I felt like this is what I prepare for. I am, I am a small, I'm, I'm in a, I'm not the most important thing. And that mm -hmm. gave me a lot of freedom because I'm like, you know what? It's just the world championships. It's like, yeah, it's important, but who's really watching fencing world yeah, championships? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. Right? <laughs> so I felt really like free to be fencing with the best and be my best mm -hmm. without anybody else really giving to... You were able to output your optimal performance in a comfortable look. environment at that point in time. Right. And I remember at the Olympic Games, I'm not the type of person that responds well to people saying, we're behind you 100%. And I'm like... That's great. But for me, as sort of a rebellious type of person, I felt I took that as pressure. And I don't think I, I, I wish that I would have managed it differently. I tried. I worked with mental trainers. And I had one really good one at the end of my career, Carl Nienheis. He works now with the Women's Foil in, in, uh, in Canada. And they're doing a great job mentally. Like, they're super balanced. Yeah. And they beat people they should never beat technically on paper. And so I, I had finally a good mental therapist at the end. Um, but I don't think I did that. I don't think I did enough to, to prepare myself for just dealing with loss or, or preparing for like a stressful environment. You know, I don't yeah. really like big events. I have to say like rock that's concerts. Something actually, like sorry, I want to say it's something I want to actually follow up on. And you think you're touching yeah. on it. Uh, when we did a podcast with your teammate, Monique, she yeah. did mention that like for her, Olympic Games was kind of something that that was the goal for the most part. Of course, everybody was yeah. doing, but like, but she has mentioned that you were under significant amount of pressure. So even she could sense that. Sure. And, and people who are prepared mentally respond to that pressure in much better ways than I did. I took mm -hmm. it really personally mm -hmm. and I just didn't deal with it properly. I think I had been raised in a way that was really nice. Like my parents were like, don't brag, don't brag too much. You're not the best, don't brag. But they were really positive, but they didn't want to raise a person who was like, yeah, look at me, you know? And I think sometimes that kind of attitude can be good at something like an Olympic games where you're just like, I'm going to win here, you know? And I, I don't know. I just was never able to calm myself down mentally enough to realize that the moment in which I was living, I was always in that moment at the Olympics thinking, did I train enough for this? Is this going to be good for me or bad for me at the end of the day? You know, instead of being like this moment is all of the past and the future together. Let's just live it. You know, look at the person in front of you. You can slow down time by just, observing what's going on and reacting instinctively and not overthinking things. So yeah. I think that it was, I, I, I didn't manage myself properly mentally and yeah, there was pressure on me, but in the end, so by nobody in the end, knew you, outside of like 50 people in Canada about fencing. By in the end, like so uh, Shereen, you had, you had four shots, uh, sure. four shots and you felt the same way and the different Olympic games. No, the first felt. Olympic games, I didn't even expect to go. Oh, okay. So they were like, oh, you're going. I was like, okay, great. Yeah, woo. And then was, but but still a lot of pressure on you, right? Still, you yeah, felt I like... Yeah, I fenced a girl who, who she was like super... <laughs> and a French girl. And yeah. she, she beat me by this like big thing that I was never able to get around. Later, I started beating her. But at the time, no, I didn't. I wasn't fencing well against her. So that was all fair. Sydney 2000, I lost fair and square in that one. And then 2004, I was really well prepared. And I fenced against a girl who had the hometown crowd behind her. And she was one of those people that reacted really well to that sort of thing. Oh, you so fenced she had, against like, the Greek, Greek yeah, national and she team really, member. Yeah, like, yeah, into it. And wow. I just like kind of froze, right? I never lost by a lot of points. I think I was lost like 15, 13 at the Olympics. And then the time after that, who did I lose to in London? To the Hungarian. I lost to a Hungarian in London. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, what about, what about 15, 2008? Uh, what about 2008, no, 2008 Beijing? Sorry, 2008 Beijing, was Beijing. Right? was when I lost to the Hungarian, yeah. Hungarian. And, then in, mm -hmm. um, and then in London, I lost to the girl who was fourth, the, um, the Korean girl. So mm -hmm. anyway, so whatever, I, 
yeah, I, I approached them always in a different way. I was always evolving and growing as an athlete, but I think my starting point for big events like that was so low that I was never able to manage it properly. I have all the admiration for the people in the world who are able to, you know, and is it, it wasn't for lack of trying. I tried everything, you know. Is it, di is it difficult for you to start with the 15 touch bout instead of start with the pools to warm up your body a little bit? No, 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 no. No, I'm not sure know. for 15 hit bouts. Okay. 15 hits, you can really make a strategy. You have enough time and Good. enough points to play with to actually create something. I hate five hit bouts. I'm just like, five hits, you just have to be like a wall. Just close down and just, you know, resist. That's right. And it's not fun, I don't think. I you don't cannot necessarily fun, comfortably though. give up that two-point touch lead oh, yeah. and then you, have to build no a strategy. There's no room to play. Exactly. Guys, so what about pentathlonists? How about they fencing about well, one point touch? Huh? How what about what about them? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like you fencing thirty bouts, one touch bout, and that's it. Like okay, yeah. win, win, lose, lose. Oh my god, yeah. this is, there is no strategy at all. Well, I think they have a strategy, a really long term strategy. Maybe that's what I think is that they know the fencers. They have like a big list. They know what they're going to do against that person. They decide and they do it, right? Yeah. I, I don't think it's like built in the moment strategy, right? So I think right. they're like, I know I'm going to do a flesh against this person. So I'm going to set up a flesh. Boom. Yeah, but Olympic Games, it's a huge best. Like everybody wants to go there, but yeah. it's only like top level fencers can go there. So we, I'm telling to my kids, like, listen, it's, it's, it's reachable level, but sure. you have to work for this. You have to put the efforts in the gym just yeah. to reach that level. And then, oh, come on, I'm going to be there like by the end of the time. Like, of course you will be there, but you have to work right now. You have to start when you're little. It's a long journey as I mentioned earlier. Yeah, it really is. It and really when is. you look back, when you look back, Shereen, like it's been like, uh, how many years you've been fencing? Like 26, from what I know. Been for 26 years? Oh 26 God. years. I'm sure oh. I know this better than you by now. <laughs> and, he, it, and when you look back, can you uh, memorize like all this competition you've been through? No, I don't even remember. No, I, I have no idea. I, I don't even remember how many competition, how many World Cups I won. I said I won five World Cups. And my husband was like, I think you won seven in just one year. And I was like, no. I was and just going to say. You should look at your results. And I'm like, really? Really? Yeah, so you'll be like, shocked to find out. I bet Shireen does not remember more than half the medals. Because I found a stat no. that said at some point in time, you have 32 medals from different World Cup would, events. I'm sure that's the most. That might be right. That you know, the most I'm favorite. sure I don't remember even a third of them at this yeah. point. What is the most favorite medal for you? Oh, that's interesting. <sighs> like you, you would have put it on the wall and wake up and look at this medal every single day, like to just remember your journey, remember your life. What gives you? Took, this? Me, for, took me forever yeah. to win the Canadian nationals for those very reasons that I told you about. That yes. it's like everybody's yeah. like expecting you. They're like, why haven't you won yet? And you're That's like, oh right. crap! So like you can only fall. So I yeah. So that it's a <laughs> so I don't exactly remember. Yeah, I don't exactly remember. Like when you said, oh yeah, then I came and won the Canadian Nationals. I was like, Tim, I'm like, oh, shut up. No, <laughs> no I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, oh, the thing, I think what I'm most proud of is uh, not a specific competition. Oh, I had one competition in Rome where they gave me most artistic fencer. Wow. Uh, I finished second, but they gave me this giant cup. It's a beautiful cup. And my kids are always like, what did you get this for? And uh, they play like Harry Potter with it. So. Wow. <laughs> They should also make a qualification <laughs> for people that will be watching. The Nationals, in the first place, that was in team. I'm not saying that was an yeah, individual. Still. So that's not, that's a big difference in Canada. You, you've either. seen Canadian team events. That's a big difference. <laughs> uh, it's just something that was for the result wise, but I'm not sure. saying that there is a level there. No, no, no. It's okay. Um, uh, so I like that one. I like getting most artistic fencer because I like the fact that they, you know, they appreciated the, not just the actual points, but how the points were, were achieved. I, I like that. Cool. I was like, oh, thanks. You so have that was grace. Cool. But um, yeah. they gave you this when I wasn't tripping. The... <laughs> oh, they um, gave for... you this award for the bout or for the touch? No, for the bout, for the competition. For the, for the yeah, whole yeah, competition, yeah. okay. Yeah, yeah. I was second, but then they were like, I wish oh, I could... giant thing. <laughs> I wish I could see you fencing once. Ah, uh, no, I, it wasn't that great. It's much better in my mind. When I see videos, I'm like, ooh, boy. So it's always better in your mind. We're always uh, yeah, the tough self-critics. Yeah, exactly. The, what, what I was most proud of, which is something that nobody would ever know about, uh, is 
when I dropped out of the top 16 after getting pregnant and the long journey to get back and qualify for the Olympics after being pregnant, because you guys don't understand this, but your wives might tell you if you have children, your body changes in so many ways. And I was like, I never had any back problems before. I never had anything. I was just like, Ooh, you know, and all of a sudden I'm like, and I remember taking lessons while I was pregnant, like just standing there. I remember I had a little ball in my, in my house really? and I was like the tennis ball. And I was like, always like, you know, smacking it. So I did so much to maintain. I, I ate like perfectly. I never had any sugar when I was pregnant. I was like so diligent because I knew I had to get back yeah, into yeah, shape right away. Into and so I was really proud of my, like, um, of coming back after huge. that. Uh, yeah. that's, wow. yeah. that's and I remember awesome. being at the Olympics in London and I remember seeing my husband and he had our daughter in the little like baby Bjorn. And I remember during the break of the match, looking yeah. and being like, hi. And I'm like, Shereen, focus up here. Like you're fencing <laughs> at the Olympics. Don't be waving at your daughter. And I'm like, maybe it's time to retire. Yeah, <laughs> bro. Yeah, you just have way too many hats that you have to take on and off the entire time. So, so yeah, some I, people I, were able to like have families and still maintain high levels. Yeah, that, but uh, there is another woman like for me, like it's uh, Valentina Vetsali. She's yeah. one of the greatest fencer in the world. I, I think everybody knows this woman. She it's had a, a break. She had a break. She got birth. Uh, yeah. And then she skipped the whole season. She went for the world championship and she won this world championship. Like, yeah. I don't know who she is. But she's yeah. the best. She is the craziest beast I ever seen. She's an alien. That's what she is. <laughs> <An alien. laughs> you know what? Yeah. Though it's so funny. In some of her interviews, she says the thing that pushes her on is fear of losing. She says she's wow. desperately afraid to lose. And wow. but she's able to manage that and mm -hmm. go and win. Which is a, that's what I mean. Everybody has a different approach and everybody has a different way of getting there. So you have to try out different ways that will get yeah, you. We to all have that. our own vice in here that we need to somehow. This negotiate. is the trigger. Everyone yeah. has own trigger. For instance, yeah. when I when I used to swim in the pool, I, I pretended that the shark behind me. Yeah. So it, it helps me to swim faster, you know, like <laughs> this That's kind so of funny. stuff. Yeah. That's what I think about a bear chasing me sometimes when I'm doing sprints. I'm like, ah! <laughs> <laughs> or fencing. Yeah. I'm like, I always think, like I say this to my to my kids too. I say, Oh, are you able to do this? Like, can you please do this? And they're like, No. And I'm like, if I paid you 500 euros, would you be able to do it? And they're like, Yes. And I'm like, then please do it. So I'm always thinking <laughs> this. I remember fencing in a match, and I remember I'm like, I'm kind of tired. And I'm like, you know what? If I was getting paid 500 euros to win this match, I would probably put in a hundred percent of my effort. Yes. And I'm like, I should definitely do that. So sometimes that works for me where I'm like, you know, are you? That's really more mature really thinking too, though. <laughs> yeah. 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 So you have to find the trigger uh, yeah. for yourself. Yeah. Uh, and everybody, like a kid, is supposed to find it because they sometimes they can lose the motivation to come for practice or go for competition. It happens every time. Or they lose competition and they then don't want to go to the, for the next one. And they have to find themselves a little. Yeah. That is the most crucial time. I think as a coach that we need to support and oblige our athletes to continue because mm -hmm. otherwise they lose dignity. They lose their, uh, they lose their ability to manage, uh, to manage failure in the future for so many other things. And I think it's not like you have to go there and be like, Oh, I lost, but you can be like, yeah, I lost. I'm going to like pick my, I can, I'm going to be, I always say, okay, you can have 24 hours to be super bummed out. Yeah. And then, you're going to stop crying. You're going to pick yourself up and you're going to show up for training on Monday. You know, I remember yes. we had training on Mondays. And even if I won the world cup on Saturday, on Sunday, I was at training on Monday and I'm like, I was tired, but I'm like, okay. And if I, I heard lost, some schools do that. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And if I lost, I'm like, okay, you still have to be a training on Monday. Right. I, did you have the thoughts? Like, uh, if I wouldn't show up, what would be? Uh, yeah, because I always knew that I would feel personally guilty. So I, personally I, I'm guilty, digging, yeah. I would feel like I didn't deserve to win because I'm always, I was always of the, of the mentality that like I train at least as hard as anybody, if not harder than most people in the world. I was so meticulous, like analyzing my opponents and I was like preparing my bag and doing all this like stuff. And I thought if I don't show up to training, I'm going to feel like I don't deserve to win because I didn't do everything I could to win. But some what? people don't work that way, right? Some people are like, they need more like freedom to play. Well. Yeah. And it, to me, it seems like you're a very objective person. I, that's why I love this conversation. Yeah. Nice. How would you judge 
your level of talent in fencing, since you've seen some high level talent versus like that determination, that grit, maybe the knowledge of the game. Like where is your talent and where is the other parts that got you where you are? Do you mean physical talent or mental talent? Well, probably physical, I will go the, towards that. Physical talent is like slightly above average, I think. I have long arms, so that helps. Mm -hmm. Like my, long, my arm length is five centimeters more than my height. So that helps. Right? I'm not going to say right. that it doesn't help. Um, <laughs> I'm, not a, I'm not fast, especially fast. So that's where I think my fencing helped me because I don't think I could have been so successful in other sports. That's um, right. Because I was able to use my brain to calculate my speed according to other people. Yes. So most of the time, even though I wasn't fast, I could pretend that I was fast or ad adjust the distance. Um, yes. So I don't think I am especially talented. I am capable of being consistent, like yes. consistently training, and I'm capable of recognizing my flaws and working super hard to overcome them. So right. I'm not someone that says, I only want to do what I'm good at. I don't want to work. I don't want to do that. I'm like, you don't think I can do that? I'm going to work super hard until I can do that. And then I can do everything. So right. it's sort mentality of like this. That I got to work twice as hard as the guy beside me just to be as good as that person beside me. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. I, for the first year of my life, there was like, if you look at my family, they were all super athletic. Mm -hmm. And then I was, you know, I had like a, a hip problem, like a hip dysplasia. So I was like one year in a cast in my, in my little crib as a baby and like a little, like a club foot where like my foot was turned. Right? <laughs> and so my parents, I'm sure they weren't like, Oh, future, future Olympian. Yay. They were like, Oh, we hope she can walk. <laughs> so I think because of that, then I was sort of like, nobody really expected too much of me. And so I had a lot of freedom to make mm -hmm. mistakes. So I think that was another thing. So, so I don't know if I would say I'm talented as much as I had a good situation with parents that were supportive and gave me yeah. lots of freedom, but required me to be consistent. I had to go to training. I, I wanted to quit fencing after the first day. I was like, this is a stupid sport and I hate it. My dad was like, no, you're going to do it for one year and then you can stop. And I was like, oh. And then at the end of the year, I was good enough that I was like, oh, it's not so bad. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. And, I and see, that's really the true essence of fencing. I will say at least particularly with Epi is that we're, it's more than just our physical presence there, right? It's definitely more than Thank meets heaven. the eye. For sure. And that's what I love about it. And that's why I think we can have so many conversations about stuff like this, because I want to hear how you guys manage this because everybody has a different approach. And we know? can do and this more than once. You, you yeah. could be our favorite guest if you yeah. do anything, <laughs> we'll make it happen. And uh, Shireen, I have a question that's, uh, sure. uh, what is the most important for you and why? Motivation or discipline? Oh, motivation. Yeah. And why? Finding um, why. Um, and it's not always the same. Your motivation is not always the same. Sometimes your motivation is to win. Sometimes it's to survive. Sometimes it's to, you know, show off. So it's finding whatever motivates you at that moment. And it can always change. Um, discipline is important, but if you're disciplined, but unmotivated, you do things without passion. And therefore you do them less than your potential. Like it means, That's true. it just means, it just means that you have no life to mm -hmm. whatever you're doing so but maybe i don't know how you view the word maybe you have a different way of looking at the word but how i define it no that's, I would say that's what we're trying to figure it out we tr we're asking everyone about this because uh, everyone has a different opinion some of them some of the people says that motivation is not that important there's discipline everything in fancy like in sport motivation yeah. is just a limit of time and it can motivate you to do some certain stuff, but the uh, discipline helps you to do it for the long period and so on. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, as you said, it's true with no patient, there, there are no, no results in the future will be. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree. Yeah. It's, that's a good point. It's, it's hard to define one or the other discipline or motivation. Uh, there, there is discipline. no right answer. There is no right answer. Sure. Uh, sure. And discipline, I think is, teaching right like jesus disciples right <laughs> yeah <laughs> they were there to learn and so discipline is important because that's how we learn so every day we get up it's not just about being like strict with your discipline means also your ability to learn from something so i think that's also obviously very important but 
But for me, for personally, for me, motivation was, was everything. And it changed all the time. Like, like after the, after I was pregnant, my motivation was like, okay, just try to qualify. See if you're capable of that, you know? And mm -hmm. so that was, that was a, a big thing. Well, that's wow. beautiful, Shireen. I think that's a great way of ending this podcast for today. Where yeah. it's, you know, just stop it on that note, but we'll pick it back up again down the line. Uh, I would like to thank you from the bottom of my heart for spending the time with us. I know you have kids there in the background. They're trying to be quiet. Oh, they're and happy. super happy. No, they're happy because I'm not interfering in their lives. <laughs> like, <laughs> Mommy, how long is your interview going to be? I'm like an hour. They're like, okay. Maybe they're like running outside, back and forth, whatever. Well, really, thank yeah. you very much for stopping by. Show your lives. <laughs> we appreciate your time. We no, thank you guys. Your... I love your questions. They were super thought provoking, and I think they're really important. And I'm so happy that you guys are helping raise up the next generation of fencers. That's right, just I think create a little coaches awareness. Coaches that are complete. And a little um, goal, a little small goal, maybe will come to fruition. Maybe one day we'll meet together in Italy. Maybe one day we'll bring yeah. our students towards you. Maybe we'll run a camp. Maybe we'll make it very exciting. We'll make something Great. best of this, okay? Good. I usually okay. come to Toronto once every, at almost every year. So this was the first year I didn't because of COVID. Of course. The so next time I come to Toronto, I'll let you know and we can meet up. Be lovely. Uh, and That's New York plan. City, of course. I can't wait. I'm getting goosebumps. Shireen, <laughs> thank you so much. It's been a no, pleasure. No, my pleasure. Thanks, guys.